Welcome to a Sweet Saver Bible School. Thank you for watching. My name is James Reinars, and this is a clip from a Zoom class I taught recently on the history of Christian hymns, with a focus on singing devotionally. There were several parts to the class, but these clips are just of the lecture portion. More information can be found in the description. Francis Abigail, 1836-1879. She died young, 40-42-ish, 40, right? 43. Um, the consecration poet is what people have called her. You know, not all of her hymns use the word consecration, but uh, many, 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 and uh, some would say her best uh, just have this poetic freedom when they're talking about giving your all to the Lord. Um, this is actually a picture of her shortly before she died. And uh, Ira Sankey, who we'll learn about uh, next semester, He's visited her a few weeks before she died and just commented on how youthful she looked, even though she was 42, 43. Um, so, I don't know, she, she looked bright-eyed, young, energetic, yet lived a, a short life with lots of frailty. Okay, about her life. Her father was a, was a churchman, a priest, musician. Um, her mother, uh, you know, uh, died when she was young, young uh, age 12. Frances Ridley Havergal was the youngest of six. <clears throat> Every account I've read has called her a very precocious learner, reading books at the age of, you know, three, uh, reading the Bible. I, I, I want to say it was like four or five, reading at least the Bible sentences correctly, learning languages, all this kind of things. Her father called her his little Quicksilver. She had a handful of different experiences uh, with the Lord, and uh, there, there's just little instructions for us all along the way. At the age of six, she was paying attention really closely in, in the church meeting. And uh, the preacher was was sharing about um, about hell and judgment and uh, the need to repent, that kind of thing. And uh, she felt really convicted, really concerned for her soul. So she went to talk to somebody at the church. You know, her father was working there, but I think there were a lot of people. She went to somebody else. And, uh, you know, he, he listened to her, but he kind of thought that maybe her feelings were because they had just moved. Her dad had just gotten a new job. They had just moved. So maybe he was like, maybe you're homesick, you know? And maybe he didn't, maybe that, who knows, maybe that guy wasn't that uh, born again himself, or he didn't recognize what was stirring in this six-year-old's heart. And uh, she, she had a kind of a reaction to that. Well, fine, I'm not going to talk to anybody out about, about this again. And, uh, you know, she, she literally didn't talk to anybody about the struggle in her soul for like seven, eight years. She, uh, in her teenage years, she went to like a boarding school in Germany where um, the headmistress and some of them were just really joyful Christians. And that's where she began to open up and eventually found a real assurance of salvation as a teenager. Okay, so from the beginning, she was an avid Bible reader. And uh, every different source I looked at, this list of what she memorized kind of got longer. I, I think I don't have a complete source. Uh, you know, see, she memorized all the Gospels, apparently all the epistles, uh, what's missing from this list is the Psalms, all the Psalms, all Isaiah. That is a lot of judgment on Babylon that she memorized, right? And eventually, late in life, she memorized the minor prophets. So she is just deep in the word. She was a person soaked in the word, always turning to the word. And uh, that's maybe a real secret to her hymns. She said this, I prefer to sing scriptural words because God did not promise that our words should return to him void. She's referring Isaiah 55 where God's promise that he does not just send out his word willy-nilly. Uh, what he says will happen, will come back, will not return void. And she says, well, I want to sing the Bible because if it's just my words, I don't have any promise that it'll mean anything. But if it's God's word, he promises that it should not return void. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that more in her songs. Okay, get your hymnal out. This is one of our homework songs, but this is a this is just like a, a great story. Uh, hymn 253 in our hymnal. Thy life was given for me. I have this really, um, I don't know what to call this, uh, daunting picture on the side. If you've studied church history, you might recognize this picture. This is actually uh, the painting that Count Nicholas Zinzendorf had his kind of seminal consecration crisis before. He was, this is in the 1600s, he was the leader of the Moravian Brethren. We talked about him last week a little bit. He encountered this uh, painting, I forget, as a child, I think as a, a child, and he just really was spoken to by God, give yourself, give your life to me. And then what's amazing, according to Chen and Malin, it's, uh, this is really, like, really the same painting. 
that Frances Havergal had an encounter before. Um, she was visiting Germany. She did that quite often, either from friends or family friends. And in the, the studio of her host, there was this painting. It's called uh, Behold the Man. Um, by an, there's, there's a lot of these. So this is the one by the Italian guy, Domenico Fetti. Fetti, my Italian is non-existent, but that one. Um, and you can see there's some Latin inscribed, uh, painted on at the bottom, right? So the, the title of the painting is Behold the Man, but there's this inscription on the painting. I did this for thee. What hast thou done for me? Uh, and that's obviously a picture of Jesus right before his crucifixion. And uh, so she saw this and just as a 22 year old was just gripped by the painting and uh, felt really spoken to by the Lord. And later that, that day and evening, she began to pen the hymn that we have in, in 253. She actually, we'll get to it. She actually wrote it in the first person originally. I did this for thee. What have you done for me? She wrote it. The whole thing came out kind of quickly and then she didn't like it. So she threw it in the fire. I've read different accounts. One is that her dad walked in and pulled it right out of the fire and loved it. Or the, and the other account is she threw it into the fire and somehow it just fell right out unscathed. You know, either way, she tried to get rid of it and it didn't work. Um, uh, so the one where, you know, the story goes where she throws it into the fire and it fell out unscathed, she, she kept it, held on to it for a few months. Eventually showed it to her father and her father just loved it. He loved it enough that he wrote a tune for it. We'll go to the tune right now. This is actually the original tune that uh, Francis Havergal's father wrote for the hymn. This is not the tune you'll learn in your, your homework. We'll learn this really great American tune that is, is kind of become joined to now. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, an L I want to sing it just so that you can get a little sense of how Francis Havergal would have sung this regularly, regularly in her church meetings, how it was first uh, published. And uh, this gives you a little sense of hymn tunes at this time, you know, mid 1800s. Thy life was given for thee. What have I given for thee? I like it. It's a really elegant tune. It's very flowing. It's very uh, simple, but it has a, a, a yeah, it's an elegance, kind of a, just a really uh, sweet sweep to it. Um, it's a little more sober, I would say, than our, our really nice Paul uh, Philip Bliss American tune that we have. Thy life was given for me, thy blood, O Lord, was shed. Really, really. I mean, this tune that we have is so memorable. Uh, that's what's great about it. But, but what her father wrote really has a great uh, sentiment to it. Uh, comment about hymns at that time. You can see this is very easy for a congregation to sing. Uh, it is has almost it's only two rhythms, right? Quarter notes and dotted half notes. Very, and it's all very uh, generally very scalar, which means the notes don't have big crazy jumps in general, right? So it's much easier for a generally uneducated audience to to sing and enjoy. Thy life was given for me. Thy blood, O oh Lord, was shed. So it's a really really sweet tune. But I want to go back to the words that she wrote. I want to make two notes about this. Uh, again, she wrote this in the first person, um, which I think has a striking effect to it. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom to be and quicken from the dead. I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Um, so there's definitely something kind of powerful about the words written from Jesus's own perspective, right? Uh, if you're wondering when the change, the change uh, to thy life was given for me was uh, requested by a, by a hymnal being published at that time in her own lifetime. So she gave permission for the change, though she always preferred the original. I love the original, but I could see why somebody would change it. You know, it's um, how, you know, Bob or Eric, how many hymns do we have that are spoken from the father's first person or Jesus's? first person or the Holy Spirit, you know, it's, it's not a direction that we often sing from, right? It's interesting. It's striking. Um, I don't know if you brothers can think of anything. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's something powerful about this, but I could also see um, a tendency to want to flip it around. You know, often we are singing to the Lord, right? <laughs> but devotionally, this is really powerful. Um, secondly, this, what I have here has verse references next to it. And uh, the source that I got this from, uh, all six stanzas had verse 
six stanzas has verse references next to them. And the, the source, you know, these people don't take the time to cite things as well as you would like to, but the source gave the impression that this was how it was in her manuscript. We made that comment earlier that she really cared uh, that her words be scriptural. She would rather sing the father's words. And if this is how she looked at her poetry, wow, two things. You can see she really was considerate of what, 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 what does this, what, does what I'm saying have its roots in truth? Is it, what verse would you put behind that? The other thing is she's not quite just quoting the verses. You can see that there, you can see why that verse connection makes sense. Um, but in some of these, she has, um, you know, personalized them, uh, you know, said them in a way that, uh, you know, gives life to it and feeling to it. Sometimes if your song is just quoting verses, it can have kind of a, a wooden quality or something to it, you know? You can show that this is a, a, a single thought process coming out of a soul, not just a patchwork of quotes, right? Well, that's the end of our section. You can learn more about a Sweet Saver Bible School on our website, link in the description. There you can find course descriptions and find out how you can join the next class. And for now, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. May Jesus bless you, and may we become a saver that is pleasing to our God.